good uh, good day everyone so we will try to discuss uh, right spherical triangles and this is mr fajardo your teacher for this day okay to start with let us have the following uh, enabling le learning outcome so first is we should be able to discuss the napier's rules later we will try to uh, uh, state the napier's rules and be able to apply this to solve for right spherical triangles okay now so what are the napier's rules so the napier's rules states that first we have the sign of any middle part is equal to the product of the tangents of the adjacent parts and the second napier's rule is that the sine of any middle part is equal to the product of the cosines of the opposite parts okay so there are uh, some words here which we have to be familiar with okay sorry so first is we have to consider what does it mean by middle part next is your adjacent parts and also we have to identify what does it mean by opposite parts and to do that we have to learn how to make uh, what I call it Napier circle so that's, that's the next thing that we have to identify or we have to find out before we proceed with the next one okay let us start with a right spherical triangle uh, let me remind you guys that a right spherical triangle is a triangle wherein there is a 90 degree angle take note it's the angle not a, not, not the side okay so if i have this kind of right triangle to make your napier circle is again just create a circle and then we will divide it into five parts actually five so we just divide it by two and then the one below it we divide it by two and the upper tri and the upper circle we divide it by three so we will be placing the 90 degree angle here okay so in this in, in our example your angle c is the 90 degrees so we will be placing c here so by looking into our triangle this triangle here so we just be placing the other parts so in this case we have B, we have capital A, we have small c, and capital B, and then small a, here in your circle. So we have to be placing it in the same order as we have drawn in your triangle. So notice I have here your angle C, the next one is B, so I'll be placing B here also. Okay, and then your angle A will be here, and then your small c. And then your angle B and then your small a so notice I drawn it in a manner wherein I followed the same ordering as in our triangle here so notice we can do it in the the opposite direction but notice it will have the same effect notice we have a just like here and then we start and we go with B angle B and then your small C and then your capital A and then your small B okay but we're not yet done with that so the next thing we have to do is we place a co here okay so we are done with your napier circle okay so we'll be using this napier circle now to identify the middle part the adjacent parts and the opposite parts okay so the, the, the middle part is any part you can choose any of these parts here you can call it the middle part say for example I use angle A as my middle part if this is my middle part what will be the adjacent parts so from the name itself adjacent parts will just be the one adjacent or beside it so in this case your small c and then your co b will be your adjacent parts okay so this will be your adjacent parts relative to your angle A. Same thing with your co, co small b. Okay? So, to determine the opposite parts, 
So, which, where, what is it? It will just be the, the one which is some sort of not adjacent to your middle part. So, in this case, relative to your small a, your, your adjacent parts will be C and then Kobe. So, your opposite parts will be the ones that are not beside it. So, this will be your opposite parts. Is that clear? Okay, so let's have another one. What if we replace the other the position of your angles? Because sometimes it is not always your angle C will be your uh, 90 degree angle. So we can actually replace it. Uh, your right angle is now called capital A. So how are we going to make our Napier circle? So the same process, I made here a circle and, and I divided it into five parts. And uh, the one below it, I'm placing here your 90 degree angle, which is your angle A. So what is beside angle A here? And the notice is beside here would be C. So I'll be placing here C and then angle B and then small a and then your angle C and then finally your small b. Okay, so this is easy as that. But again, don't forget to place co. to those beside your angle A. Now, so to identify the middle part, the adjacent parts, and the opposite parts, the same thing. So any of these parts may be the middle part. So you can choose, say, for example, if A is your, small A is your middle part, the one beside it, which is your angle C, and then angle B will be your middle part. And then which one will be the adjacent, uh, the opposite parts of your small A? So the opposite parts will be these two. Now, what if I chose uh, cos to be the middle part? So let's call this the middle part. Where will be the adjacent parts of cos? So the middle parts or the adjacent parts of cos will be angle B and then your co B. So what will be your opposite parts then? So the opposite parts will be your small a and then your angle C. Okay, so let us now try to use. Okay, next. Now, what if your middle part will be small a? So, if this is the middle part, so relative to small a, the adjacent parts of small a will now be what? So, it will be angle C and then angle B. So, relatively now to a small a, the one which is opposite or the opposite parts of small a will be co B and then co C because these two are not the ones beside your small a. So I hope it's clear now how to identify the middle part and adjacent parts. Now, the next thing is, what if we try to use the Napier's rule now here? For example, if I try to find, uh, say, if I try to use rule number one, so if you would remember, your rule number one states that the sign of any middle part is equal to the product of the tangents of the adjacent parts. So if I'll try to use uh, rule number one here, say for example, I try to use rule number one and then I'll be using say Kobe for example. If I try to use rule number one, rule number one says that if I have to get the sign of the middle part in, and then that would be Kobe, it will now be equal to one. So Kobe will be the middle part. So which one is the adjacent parts of Kobe. So the adjacent parts of Kobe will be your angle C and then your co C. So we'll just be using the tangent. So tangent of the first uh, adjacent part multiplied to the tangent also okay, of the other uh, adjacent part which is your co C. Okay, so we have we were able to apply the first Napier's rule. Now, so the same thing. What if I try to use the first rule in, and I my middle part is small a. So the same thing. So sine of small a will be equal to what? So your small a is there, and which one is the adjacent parts of small a? adjacent parts will be capital C and then angle B so we'll be using 
tangent of your angle C multiplied to tangent of angle B. Okay. Next. So using rule number two now, second rule of Napier's rule states that the sine of any middle part now is equal to the product of the cosines of the opposite parts. So take note. A while ago, for if you will be using uh, the first rule, the sine of the middle part is equal to the product of the tangents. Take note, tangent of the adjacent parts. Now, it will now be equal to the cosines of the opposite parts. So let us try to use this in the previous example that we have. Okay, now, if I try to use cos as the middle part, and I'll be using the second rule, so the second rule states that we have to get the sine of that middle part that would be cos small c, and this will be equal to 1. So since cos c is the middle part, the opposite parts of cos c will be small a and angle c. So it will now just be equal to cosine of your small a, which is the first opposite parts, multiplied with the cosine of your angle c. Now, what if I try to use the second rule again? And I'll be using angle B as my uh, middle part. So, same thing. Sine of angle B. And this will now be equal to. So, angle B is here. The, the opposite parts of that would be angle C and then cos B. So, that would be equal to cosine of angle C multiplied to cosine of cos B. Okay. Okay, now. The next one is. Notice we have co something in our uh, uh, Napier circle a while ago. How are we going to simplify it? So always remember if we have the sine of co alpha, so we can actually rewrite it as cosine of alpha, as simple as that. So if I have, uh, if this is a small a, sine of co small a will just be cosine of small a. And if I have, for example, on the other hand, I have the sine of co alpha, this will just, uh, sorry, cosine of co alpha, this will just be sine of alpha. But if we are to use tangent, this is actually cotangent of alpha. Or we can actually simplify it later on since our calculator is uh, has no cotangent, so we can actually write this one over tangent alpha okay now so I hope we are now familiar with the Napier's rules but before we proceed in solving for right triangles we will need be, we will be needing the following theorems okay so by the way take note that these are theorems only applied or applicable to right spherical triangles so the first one is so if I have a side and its corresponding opposite angle they should terminate in the same quadrant so take note so last time we have uh, discussed that since all the sides and your angles will be less than 180 degrees for convenience uh, for convenience purposes so your side and then your angles may may terminate on either the first or second quadrant only okay so if we have a side or an angle terminating on the first quadrant it means that they are acute and if otherwise if they terminate in the second quadrant they or the angle or the side is obtuse so it means that if I have a side take note here if I have a side which is acute since the corresponding opposite angle should terminate in the same quadrant your opposite angle the angle opposite the side which is acute should also be acute or first quadrant same thing with opposite angle first quadrant also next the second theorem states that if any two sides terminate in the same quadrant the third terminates in the first quadrant eh, or if any two sides terminate terminates in different quadrants then the third terminates in the second quadrant since uh, in a right triangle 
of course in any triangle there are only three sides if I have the first two sides they terminate in the same quadrant it is automatically saying using this second theorem on right spherical triangles that a third will terminate in the first quadrant so it means that if your angle or your side or the first two sides are both has the same quadrant in other words they have uh, say for example they ha they are both acute so if they are both acute according to the first statement the third terminate in the first quadrant so in other words the third should also be acute if you have uh, the first two quadrants are both obtuse so the, th the third should also be should still be acute so if I have acute acute then the third will be acute if the, if the first two are both obtuse 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 then the, the third will still be acute but according to the next statement that if they have different quadrants if for example I have an acute or obtuse then automatically the second or rather the third will terminate in the second quadrant so the third will be obtuse is that understood so this second statement is actually telling us that it is impossible for a right triangle having all obtuse in other words if there would be already two obtuse sides then the third should be acute but it is possible for all the sides to be acute so in other words either only one acute or all the sides are acute or of course if there would be one acute then there would be two obtuse so there would be other the only possibility for obtuse sides will be either there are two obtuse sides or no obtuse sides at all